This is a gap in my knowledge I need to fill, so and I help welcome. Um, and it's my second time here at Agile EE. And the interesting thing is that this is some sort of uh, some sort of relevant topic that I'm that, that I'm here for you because I think it was 2010 when I was speaking the first time at Agile EE and the me back then should hear the message that I have today because the uh, the presentation that I gave uh, back then in 2010 I'm not happy with it anymore uh, so. One thing that bothers me a lot, and I see it here at Agile EE, uh, I see it a lot on, on different events, is what kind of advice people are looking for. So when I hear questions after, after presentations, th these are frequently questions about, please give me a recipe what I should do, how you are doing this, how you are doing that, because I do want to copy that. And this is actually a problem that I'm, that I'm going to talk a, a, a lot about in my, in my session here. And I, I'm going to, to focus on how we change, why we fail to change. And not surprisingly, this kind of behavior, this kind of pattern, is one of the biggest reasons why our changes are not sustainable. So for those of you who don't know me, like, uh, my name is Pavel. I, my daily job is, I, uh, is running Lunar Logic. Lunar Logic is a web software shop in Krakow, Poland. Um, and if you like my message, if you'd like to feel how it is to work with a company that live, lives by such principles, by such, such standards, it is, always, uh, it is always possible to hire us. Uh, I'm, also, I'm also involved in global Lean Kanban community, so I'm, even though I'm not talking about Kanban in, during this session at all, I'm happy to have a chat in, in the hallway about, the, uh, about that. I also run a blog called Software Project Management, so if you're interested in Lean, Kanban, Agile, but also topics such as this one, how we change, why we fail to change, what are change models, how to design an organization that that is evolutionary changing. I also cover that in my blog, so you can find it on, uh, on the, you can find the blog under the address brzezinski.com. Uh, and you can also find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is uh, Pavel Brzezinski. So I really do appreciate any comments or feedback that you may leave for me there. So if there was such a thing as a long subtitle for this session, it would probably go like this. Improvement initiatives or change programs are like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it, but nobody really knows how to do it. However, since everyone assumes that everyone else is doing it, they claim that they're doing it too. The problem with this is that if you think about this kind of approach from a perspective, what kind of quality you would expect from change initiatives, from improvement programs, it would be mediocre at best, and most likely appalling. And you wouldn't be wrong, because whenever, whenever uh, there is a discussion around success rate of change programs, these numbers would pop up. John Cotter in 1995, basing on his research, said that 70% of change programs fail. Seven times out of ten, we fail to sustainably change our organization. And interestingly enough, back then, in 1995, it wasn't new news. In fact, these numbers were expected. These numbers just confirmed earlier research around the same topic. However, you can look at that, at that uh, research from a perspective that this year is going to be 20th anniversary of publishing the uh, John Cotter's report. So have we changed since then? Well, in 2008, uh, McKinsey decided to repeat John Cotter's research. And surprisingly enough, the numbers are still the same. We still fail to change our organizations in a sustainable manner seven times out of 10. Bain & Company, same year, 2008, a different part of the world. They are even more pessimistic. They say 70 to 90% we, we, we fail. Ron Ashkenaz, in his Harvard Business Review article from 2013, summarized a series of research from more than 40 years saying that we fail at the same rate since 70s. The bottom line hasn't changed. So the message for us, the, the starting point for that discussion is, is pretty sad. However, there is one interesting 
flavor to that discussion, which is focusing on what was happening over the course of the last 10 to 15 years. So what we've seen over the course of the last 10 to 15 years was a huge race of agile, huge race of lean. Agile aiming to change the way we work, to, to propose new methods of, of organizing work. Lean, trying to introduce this evolutionary capabilities to change, to, to make our organizations evolve. And Agile, by now, is a mainstream in big parts of the world. Lean gets adopted, and pretty broadly, beyond its original context, which was manufacturing. We talk about Lean in knowledge work context. And it get, one and the other are getting more and more and more popular. So the question is, why don't we see any change in the bottom line? Why don't we see, why don't we get any better in terms of how successfully and sustainably we are improving our organizations? Well, when I want to answer that question, I go back to the early Agile adoptions. So there were some teams, so organizations, that started doing Agile, whatever Agile back then meant, and so they started working differently. And they succeeded at that. So then other people started looking at them, well, they are doing something different. Let's look how they are working. And what did they see? Well, they see some practices. Those teams, those organizations were ad adopted different practices. And those early adopters started copying the, 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 those approaches. And they were at least to some point successful. And no wonder they were successful, because uh, th there is this thing about early adopters that they are very mindful in terms of how they are using stuff. So not only they would copy practices, but they would try to understand what's beyond the practices. They would also tweak and change this, the things that, that didn't work for them, because this is, this is the mindset of, of people who are really open to new stuff. So we would see more of such successes. Now, what would happen next? People would start codifying those methods. What would they codify? What would they write down? Well, practices. This is what we see. So they would codify per programming, they would codify TDD, uh, they would codify Scrum development model, etc., etc., etc. These are all practices. Now, the problem is that practices are very frequently, well, while most visible, very frequently are the least important parts of the real change that happened. So there is an interesting story from early 80s. In early 80s, American managers from automotive industry realized how Japanese manufacturers were kicking their butts, and badly. So they thought, well, they are doing something differently. So what could they do? They decided to go to visit Japanese factories. And surprisingly enough, Japanese were very, very open in front of, of visitors. They showed them factories, the factory floors. They showed them processes. They showed them practices. They explained how the workflow works. They showed them pretty much everything. So it was quite a surprise for Americans that you know, their competitors were so open, so transparent in how they work. Nevertheless, they, they took all the lessons and went back to US and implemented many of those practices. What was a surprise was that their companies didn't change. In fact, in some areas, they started working even less efficiently. Why? The thing that uh, American managers back then didn't realize, and Japanese did, was that practices alone are, are not nearly enough to change how our, how our companies operate. So the huge pillar, pillar of lean, which was, which was the context of that story, is a culture. And I've heard a number of times here at this event that we may build or change the culture. It doesn't work that way. We can try to influence the culture, but there are no simple levers that will pull that lever and suddenly we are, we are a learning organization. So this is a, this is a long process. But this, uh, the, this thing that American managers did was basically an example of a cargo cult. And a car the best example of, of a cargo cult is what happened uh, on Pacific Islands after the Second World War. So during the Second World War, Americans would build those military bases on those Pacific Islands when they were fighting Japan. So they would, they would bring all sorts of goods like uh, weapons, clothes, food, and they would share some of that with, with locals. Now, the war was over. Americans were gone. So the goods stopped coming. So what the locals did on some of those islands? Well, they figured out that, well, 
since we've had those those airstrips, air, air control towers, airplanes that were bringing all those goods, we need to build that stuff. And they did with bamboo. So they have bamboo airstrips, bamboo air, air control towers, bamboo airplanes. And you know what? Goods didn't start coming. I mean, they copied the practices, but it didn't work. They didn't understand how the whole mechanism worked in the first place. And this is exactly what we do with, uh, with adopting Agile, with adopting Lean. We are focusing on practices, we copy practices, and then we wonder, well, it doesn't really work, why? So my answer to that, to that dilemma is, is an iceberg. I like the metaphor of, of, of an iceberg. So when we look at an iceberg, we see just a tip of an iceberg. And, it, and this, this is a very small part. So they say that like 90% of, of the mass of an iceberg is below the waterline. So we see only a small portion of that. And that small portion, that small visible portion in our context are practices. This is what we see. Now beyond practices are principles. What made those practices work in the first place? And finally, if we go deep enough, there are values. Something we believe in that make those practices successful in the first place. So, when we look at practices, we typically focus on the upsides of introducing a specific practice or a specific method. But we frequently forget that these are not universally true things. We need to remember the context. So let me give you, let me share a few stories about specific practices in environments where they didn't really work or wouldn't really work. Anyone familiar with this? It's an easy question. So yes, this is Scrum. But I don't want to focus on the whole Scrum. Let me take one practice uh, of Scrum, which is time boxing. Well, it's not really a practice invented by Scrum. It was around earlier, but Scrum is responsible for widely popularizing time, time boxing or iterations. So the idea is that, well, we have, we have iterations. They are fairly short. So we will start delivering potentially shippable product uh, in official lingo uh, every two weeks or so. Now. Anyone knows this company? They're, they, they're building warehouses in Poland, all over the place. Uh, but I think that they are doing something else as well. So uh, anyone knows how frequently Amazon deploys their software to production? An idea? Every few seconds. Amazon deploys their software to production several thousand times a day every dozen seconds or so, so close enough. Uh, now, maybe, maybe, maybe more, even more frequently, because it's the data from, I think, 2011. So I have a thought experiment to, for you to run. Imagine what would happen if Amazon decided to introduce Scrum by the book across their development teams with, say, two week long iterations. I bet that their capabilities to maintain their site would disappear, like literally disappear. They wouldn't be able to maintain the site, to develop the, the site further. And given that they are not working on such high margins, I think that they would put the whole business at risk. They might have been out of business in the matters of months or quarters. So time boxing that seems to provide us this capability of, of delivering something very frequently doesn't seem to be universally good practice. So let me use another example. There is this, uh, uh, this, this thing that is, that is attributed to W. Edwards Deming, a systems thinker, actually a godfather of systems thinking, that 95% of performance is attributable to the system, not to the individuals. In other words, that we should be focusing on how the system is designed, how the, our work is designed, and we shouldn't be focusing on individual performance. By the way, if you look for what actually Deming said, he was focusing more on performance variability, which is something different. So Deming was saying that 95% of performance vari variability, so how outcomes of our process vary, is attributable to the system, so to the way we design how we work. So this is a nice thing. I mean, uh, Deming, one of Deming's obsessions was to, to limit performance variability, to get predictable outcomes of, of, of the processes that we design. 
Well, we want to be predictable. I mean, predictability is better than not being predictable, right? Well, anyone knows this company? Anyone? Anyone knows Angry Birds? They built it. So, another question. Does anyone know which game of Rovio Angry Birds was? Uh, it's 150. 50 is closest. 50 second. Angry Birds was, was 50 second attempt of Rovio to build a game that would sell. And as we know, they succeeded. Now, a question for you is, how do you think would Rovio expect with their 50 second attempt to get the same predictable, mediocre, lukewarm success that would allow them to survive for couple of more months, as they did in first 51 attempts? I don't think so. <coughs> in fact, the story, the story is that they, before starting Angry Birds, they said that this is our last attempt. It either flies or we close the shop. And it flew. Another example, this one is really close to my heart. I mean, me being, being part of Kanban community, uh, visualization is one of the practices of Kanban. So, um, a couple of years ago at Kanban Leadership Retreat, Kanban Leadership Re Re Retreat is, is uh, a place where we meet, like the uh, global Kanban, Lean Kanban community meets to discuss the state of the art, if you will. So, a couple of years ago at Kanban Leadership Retreat, there was a discussion about what is the right order of introducing different Kanban practices? And people have different opinions. So, if, for example, there was a heated discussion how fast we should introduce uh, work in progress limits. So there are a lot of different opinions, and we agreed that there is no right order. However, however, the thing that everyone agreed on was that visualization always goes first, always. Visualization that allows us to harvest low-hanging fruit, that helps us to understand what are the what problems we have in our process that help us to understand the process itself. It helps us to understand the status of work. I mean, there are no, literally no downsides of, of introducing visualization in any team. Or are they? Anyone knows this company? Uh, so eBay, or actually eBay has one, one of the other companies in, in Europe, and in that company, uh, they were rolling out Kanban across uh, multiple teams. And in one specific team, a team of software architects, Kanban implementation didn't go well. In fact, they stopped uh, at the first step, which is introducing visualization. So those, those people wouldn't even keep their board up to date. So when people were responsible for that, for that implementation started looking for reasons why it doesn't work, they realized that the problem in that very team was that those software architects didn't accomplish pretty much, much anything over time. So there was no sense of flow. They were attending meetings, discussing architecture, but they weren't accomplishing anything. So they feel threatened by visualization. No wonder that there was resistance from them. So we have this practice that it seemingly ha have no downsides and we can still fail miserably when trying to introduce that. Now one more example, Gemba Walk, uh, which was mentioned here a couple of times already. Gemba Walk it, it is this, this idea that we should go and see how the work gets done. Gemba Walk is introduced and described in pretty much any important book about Lean that is out there. So again, this is treated as universally good idea, universally good, good practice. Gemba Walk is supposed to give us better understanding how work flows, what problems we have, where are bottlenecks. So let me give you an example from another famous company, or maybe it will be famous someday, uh, from Lunar Logic, where I work. So I went to a Gemba Walk the other day, and this is what I've seen. It seems that the work is getting done, I guess. The problem in our context, in the context of knowledge work, is that the work is invisible. We don't work on physical items. 
We don't see bottlenecks. Uh, we don't see queues of work, tasks, uh, tasks piling up on, on developers' desks. We don't see that. In fact, this is why we introduce visualization, as it provides us proxy information uh, for what is happening in, in, in our teams. But there is another thing to that, which is, as another, another systems thinker famously said, Russell Akoff, is that the system is not a simple sum of its parts. System is the outcome of interactions between those parts. So if we treat our, our teams as, as systems, and they are systems, we shouldn't be paying attention to how each individual, individual work in separations. We should be paying attention to interactions. And if we go for a gamble walk for 10 or 15 minutes, I guarantee you that we won't see those interactions. Especially when the observer is a manager who is not sitting with a team all the time, so there would be an observer effect. So in the presence of, of, of an observer, the observed environment would behave differently. So in each of those cases, even though we started with a practice that is, that is supposedly very nice, supposedly has almost no downsides, it didn't work. Why? Because in each of those cases, when introducing that practice, we didn't understand what's behind that practice. What were the principles that stand behind coming up with that practice in the first place? What are values that authors of, of that practice believed in? And how they relate to whatever we have in our environment? So let me go, uh, let me go quickly through, through those examples and trying to focus on principles and values. We will know more about those failures. So time boxing. What principles we can figure out when we are looking at time boxing? Well, time boxing pro provides us this rhythm of work. We deliver something potentially shippable every couple of weeks or so. So we have better predictability, right? We also, ideally, allow teams to work in uninterrupted manner. There are fewer context switches. This, this should result in better efficiency. There is also one more thing, and I, uh, and I think that the Scrum community doesn't stress this nearly as much as they should. When we move from this long, few months long milestone deliveries toward it, it short iterations, we also limit, uh, uh, limit uh, the size of batches of work that we work on. So instead of planning like six months worth of work, we are planning two weeks worth of work. Smaller batches result, again, in better efficiency. So if we think what's, what's at, at the bottom of the iceberg that has time boxing on the top, there would be efficiency and predictability, probably. Now, let's look at Amazon. Do Amazon value predictability and efficiency that much? Well, no. What they value much more is their, uh, is their capability to rapidly experiment with new features. In fact, one of the things that they have in their architecture is they, uh, they, the new deployment can be automatically rolled back if it hits the key KPIs that they are monitoring. They want to have this, this mechanism of very rapid ex experimentation. And they are prepared for that. And they are not interested to, 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 to optimize for predictability or efficiency for that matter, as long as it, it hits the key goals that they have. A limiting, a limiting variability. What would, what would be principles, values behind limiting vari variability? Well, again, we want to be predictable. We want to know what would be the outcome of our, of our work, of our process. How frequently we will deliver something? What value would be would be uh, delivered to, to to our clients? Now, if we look at that from a perspective of a startup, well, do they really want to be predictable? In fact, no. They are betting on a different horse. They want to be unpredictable. They don't mind having some results totally off the chart down there as long as there is at least one result totally off the chart up there. As Mark Cuban famously said, in business, to be a success, you need to be right only once. 
And he knows what he's, uh, what he's saying because he was right only once and now he owns a, an NBA club and he, his job is basically being just running a basketball club in the best league in the world. So, and he was right only once. So in, in the context of startups or broadly understood entrepreneurship, we frequently optimize for high variability of outcomes, especially in the context of knowledge work. So again, we don't have this alignment on principles and values. Visualization. Visualization that provides us better understanding of work, better, better uh, uh, availability of information, what is happening, information about, about statuses of the work, blockers, etc., etc., etc. It translates to transparency. Now, that team of software architects, well, for them, transparency was a threat so they say a sense of safety. And sense of safety is something that we all intrinsically need at our workplaces. So transparency worked against that value that was important for them. No wonder they resisted. Finally, Gemba Walk. This is, this is actually the interesting example because when you look at it, um, you realize that actually there is alignment with principles and values. Because the same way we want to, we use Gemba Walk to better understand what is happening, the same way we want to achieve in our, in our software teams. The difference is that because of the specifics of the work, the tool doesn't work as it used to on a factory floor. So this is something that we should take into consideration as well. So another thing about principles is that uh, that some methods, and Kanban is one, one example, provides kind of a literal list of principles. So there are, these are Kanban principles. And the funny thing is that whenever I'm training Kanban, people would be like all about practices, 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 and they forget about it. And I used to describe a Kanban principles as, as a mindset that an, or, an organization needs to have in order to succeed with introducing Kanban. So, if these principles aren't true in your organization, probably trying to roll out Kanban in that organization would be a waste of time. And I can, I can use an example. Let's take the last principle, encourage, and encourage leadership on all levels. And this is a quote from my friend. He will remain anonymous because he doesn't say very good things about his, his current workplace. So what my friend said was that despite his will and knowledge to help, him, to, to help some of the teams to improve, he has neither positional power nor autonomy to do that. How does it say about principles that were on the, on the Kanban principles, especially encouraging leadership on all levels? And note, he is not a developer or a scrum master. He is a manager in that company. And he still don't have autonomy or positional power to that. That company doesn't encourage leadership on all levels. So if they approached me and they asked me, like, Pavel, can you, can you help us to roll Kanban out in, a, in our company? I would be like, no. It would be a waste of your time, your money and my time. And in fact, when we were talking about the, those icebergs, there are two of them. So one of them would be about practices or methods, and we went through those. The other one would be about the organization. So the same, the same way we can derive from a practice what kind of principles and values were cornerstones of that practice or that method, we may figure out what principles are, or values are embraced by an organization. And when we are talking about organizational values, we will typically end up with you know, that nice list of things that every single organization would claim to care about, high quality, customer satisfaction, people. Like anyone works for a company that doesn't care about high quality, customer satisfaction, people? Like anyone? I asked that question at one event and there was one guy who's like, we don't care about customer satisfaction. I work for Ryanair. <laughs> at least they are explicit about that. So, so those nice values would end up in stuff like mission statements or visions. So I question, who, uh, hands up, everyone who can, from the top of your head, quote mission statement of your company just now. One, two, three, four, five, six, twelve, around, probably, thank you. Um, you guys doesn't seem to give a damn. But it's not without a reason. It's not without a reason because what ends up in those mission statements 
are those all those nice nice qualities that companies claim to care about. It's a pretense. They would like to care about that. Reality, however, is different. The way we define organizational culture is not what's in mission statement. We define organizational culture as some of behaviors. So we should look how people behave, especially managers, especially the higher up the hierarchy, uh, the, the hierarchy they are, because then they have influence over the bigger part of the company. So their behaviors define what is, what is the organizational culture. Their behaviors define what are principles and values that an organization cares about. And those behaviors would frequently mean that there is a huge authenticity gap between what's claimed to be true and what is really true. I can give you an example. So you all work for organizations that care about high quality, right? Now, you probably have heard stories when such as, oh, a project manager pops up and says, well, TDD, writing unit tests, we don't have time for that. Can't do that. Per programming, two people, one computer, doesn't make sense, it's not efficient. Can't do that here. I mean, do they really care about quality? No. And I don't want to even start a discussion whether TDD or per programming improve quality or not. The thing is that people who intrinsically believe that these practices help in, in achieving high quality aren't allowed to use them. In our example, we, we, we care about customer satisfaction and then team members are, are asked to sell some bullshit to their clients on the in a status report because we don't want to tell clients that we are doing not according to the plan. And do they really care about customer satisfaction? No, it's all about behaviors. So, Talking about values is kind of a tricky discussion because it's not that values are either in an organization or they are not. It's not a binary question. It's a scale, in fact, multi-dimensional scale. So these are, these are Kanban values. So this is a work of Mike Burrows who took the Kanban method and derived values behind the method uh, basing on practices and principles. So if you, are, if you want to figure out whether Kanban makes sense for you, I highly recommend uh, Mike, Burrow's, Mike Burrow's values post, various values article as a starting point. So we may take transparency and ask, as an example, and ask how much of transparency is embraced by our organization? And it's not a simple answer, it's either there or not. So a team, within a team, we may have a lot of transparency. Team members would be very, very open, very honest, very transparent in front of each other. They would share, they would share everything that, uh, that they know about the work items, they would be free to share feedback with each other, etc., etc., etc. Now, the same team may not be as transparent in front of other teams, because in a situation when they, have, they do have some slack and they want to use it to learn something new or to do some system improvements, they may be afraid that if they let know others about their slack, they would be pulled to one of those doomed projects that will never end. Now, they may not be as transparent in front of a senior manager because they don't want to be criticized that they're late again and they do have all those problems. And in fact, this relationship is bidirectional. That manager won't be transparent in front of the team talking about this reorganization that they are planning because financial results of the company are not that good as they should be. And then there is the whole another dimension of communication with a client. So that team wouldn't be transparent in front of the client because, well, they, th that's what they are supposed to do. They, they are supposed to say, yes, we are doing great. And then a week before, before the deadline, they're like, oh, and we need six more months. Um, so the question is, in such a case, would introducing a specific practice, like vis visualization or Kanban, as a method would make sense. Well, to some point it would, except the impact of introducing a practice or introducing a method would be, uh, would be limited. We would see some impact on a team level, but we wouldn't see the impact in a broader context of the organization. So when we are talking about Kanban method, we are talking about scaling it up and wide. We are talking about going from the client at the beginning to the client at the end. We want to understand the whole value stream. We also want to go, to go through all the levels of organizations till the PMO. And in fact, PMOs are frequent, well, maybe not frequently, but I know stories, PMOs being very, very agile. 
But in this case, transparency, limited transparency, wouldn't allow broader for broader implementation. So this is what we should remember whenever we are trying to introduce a change in our organization, a new practice, a new method, a new way of working. We should remember that practices are only a tip of the iceberg. And what's important is below the waterline. What's important is to understand what principles, what values are cornerstones of that practice. And at the same time, it is important to understand what principles and what values are important for an organization. And only if those two lists are somewhat aligned, it does make sense to pursue the change, to introduce a practice, to introduce a new method. Otherwise, we would be just feeding up the sad part of the statistics that I mentioned at the beginning of, the, uh, of this presentation. And I know it is kind of a meta answer. It's not a recipe for you. Do this, do that, and you will succeed. But there is no recipe. So it's all about understanding. It's all about mindfulness. Because only mindful use of practice will lead to learning. And mindless use of, of practice will lead to a cargo cult. And I know that I just did the weirdest thing ever. I just quoted myself. <laughs> but with that, Děkuji. Yeah, and oh, by the way, I know that it's like super irrelevant, but if someone is up for to get one of those cards, I have some on me, so please catch me either after the presentation or, or during the break. We do have a couple more minutes. Five minutes. So I'm happy to take some questions. I was super stressed about timing. I already told you that I don't have recipes, but I have meta answers. Hi, Paul. I know I, I didn't see everything, so sorry for that. But uh, when you talk about the, this whole thing about uh, mindless things, uh, I know you have an idea on, on links with Shuhari. Did you talk about that in the course? Or? No. Uh, so, so this is. I don't have a quick answer to that. Actually, I wrote the whole article yesterday to answer that. So there is this model Shuhari, and uh, basically, uh, the basic the basic idea is that we should start with lear learning learning the ropes, l l learning really simple things, and not even asking how it works and why it works. So the way we learn martial arts. Uh, so first, we learn to punch. We don't, we don't try to win with the opponent, we try We learn to punch. And so my argument is that in the context of knowledge work, we don't know that we want to learn boxing. If we knew that, we could, we could start learning to punch. So we could start with learning how to do stand-ups, how to do retrospectives, how to do, I don't know, uh, sprint planning. But this assumes that we know that Scrum is the right thing. And it isn't necessarily so. So, uh, and, and the, the follow-up to that is that first we need to understand the method, and of course the organization, to, to figure out whether there is a match. And it means that we are already on the second level, which is ha, uh, which means that we understand the method. And when we are on the level of understanding, uh, going back to true probably makes sense, this is kind of an open discussion, but the key point is that we shouldn't start just learning to punch. We should start, why the heck do we even want to learn boxing? Because if the ultimate value is to, to win a fight, we may either way to learn, uh, I don't know, shooting. And it may be more relevant for us. So this is kind of long answer, probably candidate for a long discussion. Exactly, okay, thank you very much. Another question? So since I was the last thing keeping you from eating, <laughs> the lunch is out there. <laughs>